All right, well, in theory, we should be uh, launched off here. All the connections seem to be actually working the way they should for a change, which is kind of refreshing. So we will go ahead and get started. Welcome into Breathe TV. Uh, my name is Mike Hess. I'm a respiratory therapist, COPD advocate, COPD navigator. I wear a lot of different hats uh, throughout the respiratory therapy and COPD world. Uh, this is our um, bi-weekly show, approximately every two weeks. We, uh, I like to try to uh, shine some light on some of the more complex issues in COPD care. We all know that uh, um, people living with COPD get a lot of confusing information, get a lot of uh, very technical, um, often hard to understand information, and we on the clinical side don't often do a very good job of clarifying things and making sure that uh, you have the tools that you need in order to be your own best advocate and to be a partner in your care. So that's what this is all about. Um, we are also uh, um, we've had our Facebook group for quite some time, also called COPD Navigator. Um, that's been going for about uh, four or five years now, which is great. We have a lot of people, uh, various stages of COPD, various uh, times since diagnosis and all that stuff. We have caregivers, um, again, an often overlooked group. We have respiratory therapists, we have nurses, we have a lot of people who are all working together to make sure everybody can uh, breathe the best that they can. Uh, over the last year or so, we've also expanded out. You may be watching us uh, live on YouTube or you may be uh, catching this as a recording on YouTube. Uh, we're also starting to do these, uh, the audio versions as podcasts. Uh, you can look at your favorite podcast provider, search for COPD Navigator, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Uh, trying to break these down uh, in 2020 a little bit more easily into uh, kind of a news section and then the ideas of the day. And then uh, perhaps the most important thing in the uh, um, the live area is uh, we get to answer your questions and answer, or we get to answer your questions uh, right now uh, or toward the end of the program. <clears throat> so make sure uh, wherever you're watching this, uh, whether you are watching this on Facebook or you're watching it on YouTube or uh, wherever it is that you're, you're catching us, make sure that you are uh, leaving a comment. If you have a question, uh, do now have an email address, hopefully. Um, I believe that's uh, set up now, although now that I'm saying it, I can't remember if I activated that one or not. Um, if you're having trouble with the email, go ahead and send us a tweet or anything like that. We'll make sure that uh, your question uh, gets answered as best as we possibly can. Um, so we are going to start um, with our news of the week. Uh, so the, uh, starting off with the news of the week here um, is... The latest uh, American Lung Association State of Tobacco Control report just dropped within the last uh, couple of days here, if not the last even 24 hours. Um, the uh, ALA does this uh, every year to, uh, um, and I'm having a little bit of trouble with, uh, I want to actually read the report here, so. Uh, the ALA does this every every year to uh, identify areas that have improved with tobacco control uh, as well as areas that continue to need improvement with tobacco control. So they do an excellent job of giving us an, a whole overview of the nation um, as well as state-by-state uh, -state indicators as well, uh, trying to figure out where things are um, as far as tobacco control goes. So... Um, Text let me down as it often does, or I shouldn't say often, but as it uh, in life it often does. But here we go. So uh, looking at the uh, 2020 report, uh, their big question, uh, and they actually lead with this right on their website, is will 2020 be the year that the federal government, states, and communities pass meaningful tobacco control policies and prioritize public health over the tobacco industry. Now that may sound a little bit melodramatic, but it, it truly does seem to be the case um, in many, over many years, that uh, policymakers and legislators have tried to uh, um, listen to the tobacco industry and tobacco companies far more than public health advocates, um, people with respiratory conditions or people who are affected um, by the tobacco industry. Um, so 
they're they are careful to highlight that there were some positives that happened toward the end of 2019 um something that kind of flew under the radar until it actually happened and then even then hasn't really gotten um in my opinion as much press as it probably should is that the uh, tobacco purchase age was suddenly raised to 21 years old um that was one of the uh um highlights of this report um, the ala also mentions that uh, um, prior to that uh, several states were going with what they call tobacco 21 laws where um, you had to, the purchase age was increased to 21 um, so surprisingly enough the fda did um, um, or legislation did pass with that uh, toward the end of the year um, some other positive things according to the ala was that california illinois maine and nevada saw significant increases in funding for their state tobacco prevention and control programs in, in uh, for fiscal year 2020. Um, Illinois improved a uh, significant increase in state cigarette tax up to a dollar a pack or increased a dollar a pack. Uh, Maine uh, put its taxes on electronic cigarettes and other tobacco products to be equal with that as, as cigarettes and Vermont also added e-cigarettes to its tax collection. Uh, Colorado and New Mexico closed several loopholes in their state smoke-free workplace laws, as well as adding electronic cigarettes to that, those laws. Uh, Minnesota and South Dakota also added electronic cigarettes to uh, their smoke-free laws. Um, Arkansas uh, passed legislation requiring state Medicaid plans to cover all FDA-approved tobacco cessation materials, joining several other states, including my home here in Michigan. Uh, Massachusetts became the first state in the country to pass a law prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products, uh, including menthol. Uh, and the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, uh, their Office on Smoking and Health received a much-needed $20 million increase uh, in funding to help fight the youth e-cigarette epidemic uh, in this year's this fiscal year's budget. Um, Speaking of electronic cigarettes, that was one of the downsides uh, that uh, um, ALA is noting. Uh, there's been a tremendous increase in youth using electronic cigarettes. Um, we've seen these used for a little while now as tobacco cessation aids, even though there's not a lot of really good evidence that shows that they're effective. And we also don't know a lot of the long-term effects of these disease, and it could be just trading one uh, major problem for another. Uh, but more concerning, we've seen a lot of uh, America's youth start using these things and get addicted to uh, nicotine products uh, from a very young age. There are a lot of misconceptions in the youth community um, based on a, a couple of, of studies that have been done here um, in southwest Michigan. A lot of kids and teens are, are believing that these things are relatively harmless, that, oh, they only contain vapor uh, or mist or uh, water, uh, water products, steam. However, um, that's obviously not the case. And again, we don't have a lot of really good long-term safety data. Uh, what we do have in relatively short-term stuff, we've talked about uh, uh, last week's episode or, or the last episode, um, where we've seen that even in the short term, people are having um, uh, tissue issues, uh, changes, um, and being more susceptible to chronic lung diseases uh, down the road. So... Um, again, good news, bad news. A lot of these things, um, uh, one step forward, two steps back. But uh, we can take heart in that we are continuing to make at least some progress. And hopefully in 2020, uh, we'll see a little bit more. Uh, next up um, is kind of an interesting idea that's just come out. Um, or I just came across this in the last week or so. Um, the headline on, on this particular uh, um, article is new assisted breathing device may soon be available uh, for patients with trouble breathing, specifically with COPD. And you can kind of see um, in this picture here, uh, this is courtesy of the American Association for Respiratory Care Virtual History Museum of, of Respiratory Care. Um, this is an idea of what we call negative pressure ventilation. Um, this was the same idea that was done with the iron lungs during the polio epidemic back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and there's still a single digit number of people surviving with uh, iron lungs even today, maybe one or two still. Um, but what this device does, in contrast to the probably more familiar positive pressure ventilator where they have to actually put a breathing tube in and force air into the lungs, this device fits over the chest you can kind of see, uh, hopefully you can kind of make out right about here, 
um, there's an area where this this person is connected that's where the tubing is connected and this uh, this whole area over the chest and, and into the back is sealed off and this the area in there is depressurized basically not uh, obviously not to a vacuum um, but the the pressure is lessened so that the the chest or the whole thorax this whole section expands passively um, that makes it easier for people to take a breath in a lot of times these devices have been used with uh, neuro neuromuscular conditions um, because that helps people continue to um, get that get those breaths even when their nerves aren't working very well but uh, what this company is purporting to to say is that um, by alternating that pressure we go negative pressure and then we actually increase the pressure we can kind of replace some of the elastic recoil or the, the stretchiness that gets lost in COPD uh, particularly on the emphysema side of things we know that uh, when you have that kind of damage in your lungs uh, may I should back up a little bit the the healthy alveolus the healthy air sac where uh, oxygen goes into the blood and uh, carbon dioxide comes out is like a traditional latex balloon where you, you start blowing into it and then as soon as you stop blowing and you release the pressure it kind of contracts down we call that elastic recoil because it's like a rubber band everything just shrinks right back down forcing the air back out in healthy lungs that is a big part of the exhalation capacity that people have but when you have emphysema you start losing that that recoil and it's more like trying to get the air out of a, a hefty bag you know some kind of plastic garbage bag or something like that this idea of the, the this chest ventilator basically will then help push some of that air out and uh, make it easier to exhale and trap less of that air now my big concern with a device like this is that not everybody has that elastic recoil issue some people have an actual obstruction like when we have chronic bronchitis you've got stuff in your airways that's preventing some of that air from getting out and i don't know that this kind of equipment is going to help um, with those kind of devices so or with those kind of patients so we kind of go back to again we talked about this in the year in review um, where we're starting to look at um, COPD is kind of yes it does have this big umbrella still but we do see a lot of different kind of processes going on here we need to be a little bit more careful as to how we're, we're uh, testing and evaluating some of these devices instead of just saying that this works for the COPD population or this is approved for COPD we need to be a little bit more careful and figure out what populations we this device or, or similar devices are actually going to be used are going to be appropriate for and our uh, final news uh, topic of the uh, the week here is um, has to do with nutrition a few weeks back we had a, a, a uh, somebody joined the group um, who was making a lot of claims about uh, different kinds of nutrition um, and a lot of different things where um, there was a lot of misinformation basically what was going on and some of the general idea was great we do absolutely overlook nutrition a lot uh, we forget to talk about it we um, fail to get people uh, to account for people's nutritional needs which again are very different depending on uh, individual cases um, but it's again very difficult to have this kind of one-size-fits-all solution and, and, and this this study that actually came out um, toward the end of 2019 uh, but I wanted to link to it because I, I wanted to talk a little bit about it today this shows the complexity of trying to talk about nutrition in any kind of setting uh, this study which uh, came across was uh, um, published in the annals of the American Thoracic Society we can get a, a link if, if uh, anybody's interested in that uh, wanted to look at uh, um, the use of these of uh, omega-6 and omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids um, in respiratory conditions because we know that omega-3s um, can be relatively healthy and omega-6s can sometimes not be healthy and so uh, we go through and we look at a lot of these things we look at you know where you can find some of these 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 disease these uh, um, fatty acids we f they found that uh, every one gram increase of intake of the omega-3 fatty acids was linked to uh, better COPD assessment test scores, uh, better St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire scores, and better COPD uh, questionnaire uh, scores, which indicates that um, people are having improved quality of life um, 
with these uh, with these by increasing your omega threes, but the omega sixes had just the opposite. Um, they actually, the more omega sixes you had, the worse your scores could be, and, and actually you are at higher risk of uh, flare ups, exacerbations, um, the more um, omega sixes that you took. So a lot of times when you see advertisements or you see this food contains omega fatty acids, you do need to dig a little bit deeper and be a little bit more careful as to what you eat because um, you know we can look at what it, and, and we can look at what kind of food um, has both of these. Well, you look at um, omega six. There's a lot of nuts, a lot of fish. Um, various oils, things like that. Unfortunately, we get a lot of these oils, especially if you eat some of the, the fatty foods and things like that. Um, you look for omega-3 fatty acids, and you get you get uh, a lot of nuts, a lot of fish. You know, you get the, these these things again, and so. It's very difficult when anybody tries to tell you that there's a one size diet that fits everything, whether it's um, the, the keto diet, which has shown success in a lot of people and not so much in others, whether it's improving your omega intake, whether it's whatever diet it is, you have to be very careful to remember that your individual uh, dietary needs, your metabolism and all that stuff, your exercise level, all that is really going to have a big say in what your proper diet should be. And there is no one size fits all solution in any of this stuff, whether it's nutrition, whether it's medications, whether it's therapy, just doesn't happen. Uh, so that uh, that's a summary of our news of the week. Um, and so I wanna get into, uh, well, first off, we'll take a second and see if we got any comments here. Uh, we've got uh, LK checking in, uh, thanks for joining us, K. Uh, diagnosed with COPD, um, absolutely uh, not a pleasant thing to have. Um, that's one of the things we try to do in our group, COPD Navigator here on Facebook or uh, on Facebook, if you happen to be watching somewhere else. We've got a lot of people um, who are dealing with, with similar things that you do and as a clinician. That's something that I always try to empathize, empathize, emphasize. Um, not only with other clinicians to remind them of this fact, but um, the people that I, I that are in my care. I cannot, I am never going to tell you that I know how you feel because I don't. I don't have COPD. I don't have those difficulties. I don't have those barriers. And so that's why it's important to have a place where you can go and talk to other people who are on that path, having those challenges, facing those barriers, um, and continuing to thrive and that kind of what, what we in, in medicine call um, peer counseling or that that peer-to-peer -peer stuff that is invaluable so i certainly understand where you're coming from um i can uh, um i know that it's got to be difficult but uh, i don't i don't face those struggles but uh, if you're not a member of our group k i think you might be relatively new uh, your name seems awfully familiar um, I hope that uh, you consider joining us and uh, stop by and saying hello. Uh, I'm going to do another quick look real quick, see if we got any other comments anywhere. Um, sometimes the notification system is a little bit sketchy. Um, unfortunately, that's just uh, the uh, life with technology, I suppose. Um, we're just checking a couple sites here. Again, if you have questions that uh, you're looking to get answered or anything like that, uh, make sure that you're uh, dropping us a line in the comments or um, sending us a tweet. You can try the email. Like I said, I'm not sure if that is uh, set up just quite yet. But um, drop us a line and uh, we'll get your questions answered uh, toward the uh, toward the end of the, uh, the show here. Uh, Jenny does check in and says weight loss is a real problem. And yes, absolutely that's true because we see a lot of people... Um, see a lot of people who are able to buy the food and cook the food and all that stuff but by the time they're they're done with all the prep and all that stuff they're just too tired to eat it uh, and so we see people have unexpected or undesired weight loss with that on the flip side because we know that um, COPD makes it hard to breathe and when you when it's hard to breathe it's hard to move we see a lot of people who end up putting on some extra weight because 
um, they're not getting the activity that they should. So again, that's one of those reasons why it can't just be a one size fits all solution. So uh, thank you to Jenny for uh, firing that up and welcome in from Mississippi. Uh, but with that, we're going to get into our main topic for the day, which is bronchiectasis, which I traditionally call um, a, the phantom menace of, of COPD, because a lot of times um, it is really difficult to and underestimated um, in COPD care. I make that a little bit bigger here um, because a lot of people also don't know what bronchiectasis is. When we're talking about COPD, we're often talking about um, bronchospasm where those muscles in the lungs kind of clamp down or we're talking about inflammation where you get the swelling and all that stuff in your airways or we're talking about um, our, our mucus hypersecretion or you're coughing up a lot of junk all the time. We don't often talk about this bronchiectasis stuff um, and we should because um, some studies tell us that 50% uh, or even more of people living with COPD um, have undiagnosed bronchiectasis and that's a real issue. So we're going to take a look at uh, up top here. You see your normal airway that, again, is just kind of um, a cylinder, kind of like a paper towel tube, more or less. Uh, it's got a uh, what we call a lumen, the inside where the air goes back and forth. Um, it's surrounded by some muscle tissue, and uh, that's where that bronchospasm can come into play when those clench down inappropriately. But what we're also seeing here is um, the bronchiectatic airway and uh, you see that even we clinicians have trouble with uh, with some of these words sometimes but the bronchiectatic airway gets kind of dilated gets kind of stretched out and floppy and just kind of garbagey um, and that allows a lot of, a lot more mucus to kind of accumulate it's not even a, it is a hyper secretion issue where you're making too much of it oftentimes but it also just kind of sits there because when you don't have that muscle tone, it's a lot harder to clear that stuff out. And that is the biggest issue with bronchiectasis because we see that um, you have this accumulation which creates this great environment for more bacteria to grow, which in, in turn creates more of an opportunity for um, um or creates more uh, mucus you know when your body's response to uh, more uh, bacterial infection is to create more of this mucus um, we see this kind of vicious cycle which we'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit but um, basically what's going on is your airways are getting floppy and you're having a lot of this mucus accumulation now I mentioned a few minutes ago that as many as 50% of those folks uh, with bronchiectasis uh, uh, concurrently with COPD go undiagnosed. And so th the question is, well, if we know that, why aren't we looking a little bit more closely at why those people are going um, undiagnosed? And the reason to that is a little bit funny. This is a zebra. In the medical world, a lot of times we, um, wh whatever discipline you're in, whether it's a, a physician, nurse, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, respiratory therapist like myself, whatever clinician you are, you're usually taught that this, this, this um, truism, I guess is, is this saying, that when you hear hoofbeats, you should think horses and not zebras because because we want to take such good care of, of the people we see, we want to cover all the bases. We want to make sure that we're thinking about everything on that differential diagnosis. But usually, it's very basic. Usually, you know, the, the, there's the old Sigmund Freud saying that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. It's usually, you know, sometimes it's just a cold. Sometimes it's just these things. And we get caught up in looking for these relatively rare animals Zebras are much more rare than horses. They're not, uh, uh, you know, it's not like a, a super extinct thing or anything like that. But you're much more likely to see a horse than you are a zebra. And so when you have these symptoms of bronchiectasis, like this cough all the time or recurring infections and things like that, it's very easy to think, well, we already know you've got COPD because we've been treating you for that for a while now makes more sense to think that you're in the frequent flare-up, the frequent exacerbator type of COPD than to have this 
this bronchiectasis. Because another issue is it's difficult to diagnose. There aren't really very good lab tests for it. There are, excuse me, there are some tests that we can do for it. We're going to talk a little bit more about diagnostics as we get through the program here. But it's, there's not one test that you can do and say, uh, easy to do and say, oh, yep, bronchiectasis. It's not, you can't do a sputum sample for it. You can't do a lot of these things and have it be an obvious bang on answer. And so because we're thinking horses and not zebras, we're kind of overlooking the zebra sometimes. So we have to kind of thread that needle a little bit more. So how do we do that? How do we start looking at... Um, who is the most uh, appropriate person? Well, this is a slide um, that I've, I've done this talk a couple of times with uh, um, um, some of our medical team where I work, and we look at patients with, with COPD and uh, um, bronchiectasis at the same time are far more likely to be those people who are flaring up more often, who are going to the hospital more often, who are having the, these uh, significant issues, who are coming down with pneumonia on a frequent basis, so while we tend to think that maybe these folks are just the frequent exacerbator phenotype, as we call it, or the people who just have that kind of COPD that flares up a lot, most of these folks have some degree of bronchiectasis, according to um, a few studies that are out there. Again, not a hard and fast rule, not guaranteed or anything like that, but this is where... Um, if you feel that you're ending up in the hospital a lot, if you feel that you are having these issues, or um, for all my clinician friends out there, if you're seeing folks in the who are who are doing this, the folks that keep coming back into your ERs every now and then, or that you see on a quarterly basis um, out on the med surge floor, these are the folks that you might want to start thinking. Hmm, are we considering bronchiectasis? Are we considering, are we starting to hear zebras instead of horses because the treatment for the horses isn't working so well? And it's important to do that fairly early on because again, we have this kind of cycle I alluded to a little bit earlier where you start having this inflammatory response, this irritation, um, the way I usually describe it is uh, if you ever scratch your hand, you know how it kind of turns red and swells up a little bit. And that same thing can happen inside your lungs. And once that starts to happen, we start seeing this whole cascade of stuff, especially once bronchiectasis damage starts to take hold. We see this inflammatory response. We see the mucus. We see internal cellular um, immune system defenses start to kick in. Um, then we see that maybe it's not quite enough because you're already dealing with chronic issues like COPD and most people with COPD have other chronic issues to deal with. So your immune system may be weakened a little bit and then we start seeing more mucus and we start seeing more inflammation and we start seeing that you can't cough it up because you've got so much of it and those airways are getting floppy and you don't have that muscle tone to help push that stuff out that, that the the what we call the mucociliary ladder the the muscles and the little hairs inside your airways are just having trouble pushing that stuff out because they're getting floppy and they're just not working well you start getting plugs you start getting mucus that's so thick and so copious that it starts blocking off chunks of your lungs blocking off airways then we start seeing actual damage take place which your body's response to that is to inflame more and we start going through the whole circle again i guess i should yeah i was going the right nope i was going this whole circle so i'm going the same way as the loop there someday i'll remember that everything is backwards when i'm looking at it on the screen and get that through my head but it's trying to it's like trying to walk and chew gum or pat your head and rub your stomach at the same time it just doesn't work real well but in any event we start to see this whole inflammatory cycle go and obviously it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse until you're in the hospital all the time and you're on all these other issues so what can we do as clinicians or what can you do as caregivers and as people living with these conditions what can you do there's actually a very easy way to remember when you should start thinking about bronchiectasis it's called spur when you have severe lung problems including severe exacerbations when you have persistent lung problems when you're starting to have these issues happen over and over and over again 
when um, you have unusual infections. This is where some of those sputum tests and some of the other tests can come in. If you get an unusual bacteria that's not necessarily present in your common in your community, or when again, these things are happening over and over again, even whether they're continuous or whether they're what we might call episodic, where it happens here and then it happens again, then it happens again, it happens again. We start seeing this spur phenomenon or this, this spur criteria, that's when we should start thinking about bronchiectasis. And that's when we're gonna start making a difference in some of these people who haven't been diagnosed yet. So then the question is, how do we diagnose it? Well, I'm glad you asked. The uh, the biggest thing to um, oops, the biggest thing to trying to figure out um, how we can diagnose it. The the gold standard, so to speak, diagnostic test for uh, bronchiectasis is a CT scan. And what we look for is a certain a couple of things on these CT scans because, again, um, and I've heard this from some people writing about and, and working in radiology that oftentimes even radiologists who do this kind of thing for a living can overlook it unless they're looking for it because it often looks like other stuff. So we do have the, this one phenomenon, I'm gonna to try to make this a little bit bigger, um, try and make it show up a little bit better. We have this phenomenon called the, the signet ring sign where you can kind of see um, at these yellow arrows are where these yellow arrows are pointing to where those yellow arrows are pointing to, you can see where it looks like one of these big signet rings, you know, the, these rings that have the big blob on top of it. You can kind of see, and I, I really wish I could point a little bit better, but you can see, again, the, uh, the, um, the arrows do a nice job of, uh, um, yep, you can't see through that picture. Um, the arrows do a nice job pointing out the signet part of the ring, and then you can see that, that airway there. What that is, is that is actually, this is a CT scan kind of looking from um, top of the lung toward the bottom. The hole in the middle where the finger would go in the signet ring is your airway. The signet part um, that sits on top of it is the accumulation of mucus in a dilated airway. So we can look for, for that, uh, that issue. There are some, some other signs that you can look for. There's one called tram tracks because uh, sometimes if you look at uh, the lung, um, like I said, this one is looking from here to here. If you look at the lung from front to back, you may see thickening of the airway wall and it looks like train tracks. Or you have this one that is really obvious and we'll blow this one up again a little bit here. Um, this is a pretty severe form of bronchiectasis called cystic bronchiectasis, uh, where you actually have a, what they call a bunch of grapes formation, where um, the damage has gotten so big, it's actually kind of damaged some of the lung tissue itself and made these cysts inside your lung. And when you're laying flat uh, on the CT scan, you, know, you can kind of see, I'll well, point this way, uh, this is your spine, this is somebody laying on their back, um, this big white thing is the heart here. Um, so they're laying on their back and you can kind of see where these yellow arrows are pointing to. That is mucus accumulating in these cysts, these big sacs, holes in your lungs. Um, and this is another sign of bronchiectasis. This obviously is, is very severe and you probably noticed other issues going on before that. But these are, these are some of the radiographic signs of how to do that. So what do we do about bronchiectasis once we get it diagnosed? Well, a lot of these issues have come through um, the cystic fibrosis world because what we see with bronchiectasis is very similar to what we see in cystic fibrosis. And so there are a couple of things and, um, well, shoot, I would have sworn I brought that home with me, but apparently I did not. So, um, I'm going to see if I can maybe find a picture of this thing real quick. Um, the Bear with me for just one second. I would have sworn I had one of these sample things at home. Um, and I was going to grab one before I left the office today, but I thought, nah, I got one of those, so no problem. Um, but
but we have this little gizmo here. Um, this is one particular brand. Um, it's the one that we happen to use in our office. Um, come on, give me a picture. The joys of live media. Appreciate everybody bearing with me for just one more second. Almost got it going here. And oh, come on. Why are you giving me hassle? Every time I think I have things figured out, uh, another curveball at me here. In any event, what what this what this device is, is um, what we call oscillatory positive expiratory pressure, or OPEP. And what it does is we're trying to um, do a couple of things where first off, we're giving a little bit of resistance so that we're opening up the airways a little bit more. And we're also introducing a little bit of vibration into uh, into that the airway itself. And uh, had I the demo, um, it would be a lot more clear, but um, we will make do here. Here we go. All right, so this gizmo, um, again, this is one brand of it. It's called an Aerobica. Maybe you've seen some of these. Um, there are also some devices um, called an acapella, and I thought I had one of those sitting around here, floating around here, too. Um, alas. I am a bad media host, so sorry about that. But in any event... What these devices do is you blow through them. You can see this one's got a, a really obvious mouthpiece here. And as you blow through it, you get, uh, there's a vein inside that wobbles back and forth. And it actually creates um, pressure. It actually sounds a lot like this. when, oh. And that vibration helps knock loose some of the, the mucus that accumulates in those airways. So that's one way to go about it. That's um, um, kind of the basic way to go about it. A uh, relatively mild bronchiectasis that's going to do a good job of knocking that stuff loose and enhancing your cough. You do a few rounds of these, whether it's this, whether it's an acapella device, or there's a handful of other ones that are out there. Um, they work pretty well. They all work on basically the same principles. Um, everybody kind of has their own preferences, or uh, some uh, healthcare systems have their, their individual preferences. In any event, um, they can work pretty well. Um, the other, when things get a little bit more intense, um, you can actually get um, a vest. And uh, this is my old buddy here that I got from uh, one of our handy reps. Uh, her name is Melanie. I really appreciate her uh, taking care of our patients very well. Uh, this vest, this is obviously a miniature one that goes on a little teddy bear here. Um, this straps on with Velcro, uh, or with these straps here. Um, there are two main processes that work there are a couple of the brands use these uh these tubes where you can see this this connects to tubing that then goes to a giant air compressor that then um, actually fills this with air and then vibrates the air from the outside so it's similar to that opep but this is a lot more intense um, and it works from the outside so this is vibrating and percussing your entire lungs and it actually does, if you see somebody watching or working one of these things, it actually does look a lot like this. Um, there's another device out there that is a little bit more portable. Well, it's a lot more portable because it's battery operated and uses electronic motors instead of the, the pneumatic push or the pneumatic percussion. Uh, the motors are oriented a couple different spots around the, the front and, and the back. And those motors, uh, kind of like uh, if you've ever played a... a uh, one of the more modern video games with the vibration controller, um, like uh, Nintendo Wii or the Playstations or Xboxes, all those things. Um, 
those things uh, um, have low motors inside too and that's the kind of vibration you get from these um, obviously it's a lot more portable it's you're limited a little bit more by battery life in that regard but you're able to do these things while you're out for a walk or while you're driving or you're know, doing a lot of these things so again not necessarily a one size fits all solution because all of these therapies are going to work a little bit differently for different people some of them are going to, or some people are going to need the different vibration patterns you know each company will tell you that um, their individual pattern is the best their waveform is the best their this is the best blah 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 again one size uh, no one size fits all solution make sure you're customizing your care uh, to your individual situation but uh, those are kind of the biggest things that, that we do now of course there's also medications that we can use uh, remember that a lot of the issue comes from this this ongoing colonization or infection by bacteria so a lot of times will you we may use um, antibiotic therapy sometimes even inhaled antibiotic therapy uh, to help cut down on some of that stuff we use uh, we can use bronchodilators because the issue isn't so much bronchospasm sometimes they can have limited effectiveness um, we do use a lot of inhaled corticosteroids because again that inflammation cycle goes in there we want to try and break that um, and we want to try and do that as effectively as possible without the use of the systemic steroids that really give us a lot of those prednisone side effects those infamous uh, infamous side effects with that um, so um, again therapies can be customized to uh, individual needs and, and all that stuff uh, but that's kind of the, the bottom line to a lot of these things um, is trying to figure out what's going to work the best uh, for your case so the bottom line here we've got three main goals when it comes to bronchiectasis uh, first off we want to try to improve that uh, that diagno that diagnosis so remember go back to spur the severe persistent unusual uh, uh, critters in there or recurring things and uh, talk to your um, care team about maybe if we should be considering bronchiectasis um, because the only way to access some of these therapies is with that formal diagnosis particularly the vests you need to have that ct scan uh, with a uh, uh, recognizable bronchiectasis on ct scan um, once we get into the therapy mode we want to make sure we're preserving whatever remaining lung function there is and trying to slow down any disease progression by breaking that inflammation cycle and making sure that you're able to clear those secretions whether it's with a vest device or whether it's with a um, uh, um, um, the OPEP, the uh, um, um, oscillatory positive expiratory pressure devices that, that vibrate directly into the airways. We want to reduce your flare-ups. So again, we're going to do a lot of these same things to reduce the exacerbations because the more exacerbations you have, just like in COPD, um, the faster your lung function is going to go down. And we also want to maximize your quality of life. We know uh, on the clinical side that it's frustrating when you're coughing all the time, when you're in the hospital all the time and all that stuff. So while we may not be able to repair that damage, uh, we do want to give you the therapies that you need um, to live your best life with with uh, the barriers that you do have or the obstacles that you face. So these are the three main goals. Uh, so again, if you're seeing uh, these issues and you, you are uh, concerned that you might be at risk for bronchiectasis, uh, make sure that you are talking with your care team to uh, um, get yourself diagnosed and uh, get yourself taken care of. Uh, with that, that is our uh, lesson plan for the day. So I, I did see some questions come through. Uh, we've definitely got some time left. Um, if you've got uh, something on your mind, whether it's about bronchiectasis, whether it's one of the news things that we had uh, first off leading off here, um, or whether it's an unrelated topic that you just want to get some insight um, from uh, a COPD clinician, uh, get those in the comments here. Um, Judy checking in. Um, uh, thankful for the information you provide to us. Judy, it's my pleasure. I'm happy to uh, share knowledge that I have. And again, I encourage everybody to uh, join us in COPD Navigator on Facebook and uh, learn from other people dealing with a lot of these issues. Uh, Carla checking in from Tulsa, Oklahoma, also uh, not super excited about COPD, which is completely understandable. Uh, no energy, trying to quit smoking cigarettes. Um, Carla, thanks for, for sharing that with us. Uh, trying to quit smoking is um, good news, bad news. Uh, quitting smoking is one, uh, the absolute best thing you can do to slow down the, uh, the any kind of disease progression, uh, but it's also the most difficult thing because... Um, it is truly um, a 
a lot of times we look at it as a bad word, but it is an addiction. You are addicted to these things. And not only are you um, chemically addicted, as we say, but also there's a psychological dependence on these things. These are a security blanket for a lot of people. It's part of your identity. And uh, again, on the clinical side where we like to give people stuff, uh, whether it's nicotine patches or some of the other smoking cessation aids that work very well for what they're targeted to do, we forget about the counseling support and those other things that go into effectively um, not just quitting, but changing your habit. Um, that's how I like to look at things is developing a new habit, uh, a new security blanket, a new coping mechanism, a new hobby. Uh, these things all help um, get people off uh, the need for cigarettes. Um, but it is very difficult. Uh, anybody who has broken their New Year's resolution can tell you how difficult it is to uh, change a new habit, especially when it's uh, something that uh, has been ingrained for a while or you get a, uh, a subjective benefit from that. You, know, you get that, that surge of that nicotine rush or whatever it is. Very difficult to do, but um, I encourage you to not quit quitting and uh, work with your, again, your, your team to come up with the smoking cessation strategy that's going to work best for you. Um, also mentioning got CBD oil to quit smoking cigarettes, but it makes uh, makes me more cough more than the cigarettes. I don't understand why if it's for stop smoking. Well, um, CBD oil is tough. That's one of those things that's kind of a new fad right now. I haven't seen a lot to support it. Um, it's like I said, kind of a fad right now. There are some people who will swear by it and that's cool. I don't want to take that away from anybody. Um, uh, but again, everybody's going to be sensitive to different stuff too. So it could very well be that you're sensitive. You have a sensitivity to the CBD oil, just like people have sensitivity to poison ivy or, or sensitivity to, you know, pretty much any other substance out there you could just be sensitive to it and therefore it's making you cough. That's not really where I would go with tobacco cessation right now. Again, a lot of it is trying to come up with um, a good new habit, uh, replacement habit, things like that, um, as well as trying to break the, the um, addiction to nicotine. But um, CBD oil is certainly something that a lot of people have tried. It's just, uh, I, I would not call it for tobacco cessation. Um, so maybe that could be a reason why it's making you cough. You could just, it's not necessarily for that. Um, so it could be an unfair, um, unfair promise or an unfair guarantee, but, um, could just be that you're sensitive to it. So, uh, we'll scan around for another second here. Uh, again, if you've got some questions, feel free to, uh, drop them in the comments here or send a tweet. Um, or whatever it is that you would like to uh, to chat about here. Uh, again, the notifications aren't going super great, so we're going to ask, uh, scroll around just a touch here. Um, again, you can join us here on uh, Facebook. You can join us on YouTube. Um, doesn't look like anybody is uh, chatting on YouTube, so that's cool. Aha! There we go. Now we've got some... Uh, it's amazing what a little reload can do here. Uh, so David Leatherwood, yes, CBD oil isn't necessarily for quitting smoking. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's not, uh, not necessarily what that's for. So, uh, Veronica, uh, checking in, uh, as a caregiver, thank you very much for, uh, all the, the work that you do as, as caregivers. Um, checking in, uh, saying also a personal support worker. So this information helps want to do everything you can to support your husband. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you uh, saying that it's going to help. I certainly do hope it helps. Uh, again, we do these shows about every two weeks or so. Try to get them done. Um, and then we'll hopefully this year we're going to do a lot more with uh, some media, both audio and form of podcasts and some other stuff on uh, YouTube. So hopefully we'll get some more resources uh, going on for you. I uh, got a couple other people who are talking about aerobica. So those can be great for also chronic bronchitis. Uh, more traditional COPD kind of stuff. Um, so that's great. Um, use them. Uh, Jenny asks, would lung volume reduction surgery help this condition? Um, it can. 
It um, that's uh, something we're going to be talking about in uh, a couple of sessions from now. Lung volume reduction surgery can certainly help, um, as well as some of the newer techniques out there, where we or what are called bronchoscopic lung volume reduction processes, um, where they can implant valves and coils and things like that that can help shrink down some of the the uh, damaged areas of the lung and help the healthier lung work a little bit better. Um, again, not a one size fits all thing. The, the lungs are kind of weird beasts in that we have this normal um, set of airflow paths that we call the bronchial tree, the usual tubes. But then sometimes we have shortcuts, bypasses, all these things. We have little uh, um, areas that aren't part of that normal route. And if you have too many of those things, then whatever we do for lung volume reduction um, can just reinflate those areas again. The traditional surgery where they actually go in and take out chunks of the lung is relatively is relatively risky. I mean, it, it's an invasive surgery where they're cutting out a chunk of your innards. And there's a lot of risks that go along with that, with infection and all that stuff, uh, which is why people are moving, starting to move a little bit more toward these, these bronchoscopic procedures, um, which are fairly new, somewhat proven, but again... Um, using the right procedure and the right person is absolutely critical to getting a good result. So uh, it's a long way of saying they can help. Um, it's not necessarily that they will help, but it's certainly a possibility. And uh, if that's something that you want to consider, I would definitely go to uh, find a, a, a pulmonologist in your area and uh, have a chat with them about uh, if you might be a good candidate for it. So all right, we got a couple of question or a couple of minutes left. Uh, last call for questions here. Um, we'll be doing this again in again in about uh, two weeks, um, where our topic will be. I always forget to look at the topic, um, but I should have that marked down here. So we're going to be coming up on uh, February twelfth. Um, where we're going to be talking about uh, another thing, you know, we talked a little bit about in tobacco cessation where we don't always take care of the, the person. Um, we don't do the counseling that we should do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the mental health issues that go along with COPD. We know that a lot of people dealing with this condition um, have a lot of anxiety, have a lot of depression, a lot of isolation. So we're going to talk about what we can do to help uh, lower that burden a little bit. Um, strategies where you can take care of yourself and maybe some techniques where um, you don't feel alone and uh, you feel feel a little bit more comfortable talking with your clinician about what the best plan forward is for you so uh, tune in for that February 12th we're gonna uh, we're aiming for four o'clock eastern time again um, we will uh, definitely make some notices if there are any other issues out there uh, we did start late today, and for that, I apologize. It's just uh, that's one of those things that, that happens, um, as you may expect. But uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap things up for the day. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out and spending part of your Wednesday with us. Uh, again, look for, um, look for some of these things uh, every couple of weeks, and uh, keep an eye out uh, on YouTube, on Facebook, um, and keep an eye out. Uh, you can look again wherever uh, if you're a podcast uh, listener. We've got some of the audio up from previous episodes on uh, um, Spotify, on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We're getting some more stuff out there too. Let me know what topics you want to see. You know, again, these are uh, these these are designed to help you be the best advocate uh, for your own care, a good partner in your care. Um, so let me know how best uh, COPD Navigator and Breathe TV can help you. Um, whether you are someone living with COPD, caring for someone with COPD, clinician, advocate, or just uh, healthcare curious, uh, let us know and uh, we will answer your questions and uh, hopefully get these topics covered. So again, thanks for coming out this Wednesday. Uh, my name is Mike Hess. I appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And uh, we will see you on February 12th on Breathe TV. Take care, everybody.